Today we'll be having two Bible readings. The first Bible reading will be taken from the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 16 to 21. For we did not follow cleverly devised made, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We have ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture came from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And our second Bible reading will be taken from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 14 to 17. 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 14 to 17. But, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how, how from childhood you have been acquainted with the, with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord. It's really a delight to be uh, together again um, after such a, a long time. And it is a privilege for me to be opening up God's word for us uh, this morning. For those who are joining us for the first time, my name is Black, and I am uh, the young adults pastor here at Christ Church Midrand. Um, our young adults ministry is called the tribe. Uh, Joel is actually uh, one of our, our young adults who comes to the tribe. Um, so welcome to uh, you if you are joining us for the first time today. Uh, you found us at a very special time in uh, the calendar of our church. And um, we are focusing on our stories. All of us sitting in this auditorium watching at home have a story. Um, and our stories in one sense mean nothing. Uh, in and of themselves. Um, they get value, ultimately, and meaning from God's story. Um, and so that's what we want to look at um, in these next couple of weeks, starting from today. Um, and the question that we're going to be answering is probably on the screen behind me, uh, but is the Bible a bunch of fairy tales, uh, and is it relevant for us today? Um, that might be your story as you sit here this morning, and uh, you are in, in good company because there's probably more than one of you um, uh, who's asking this question. And I think it is a question that's relevant for all of us, uh, regardless of where we are in our faith journey uh, with the Lord. But speaking of stories, let me tell you um, a story, a true story, in fact. I found myself in the middle of the parking lot at Kailami Corner uh, speaking to Karabo, and I was sharing... Uh, the Christian faith with him, when he interjected and he said to me, bro, um, I know where you're going with this, so let me just tell you what I believe. Right? All religions fundamentally aim to do the same thing. And so I asked him what that was. Uh, and he said, well, we are born good, society corrupts us, all religions, including Christianity, wants to make us good again. To which I said to him, that might be true of all other religions, but it's certainly not true of the Christian faith. That's not the aim of Christianity. In fact, that is not the message of the Bible. In fact, the Bible's message is this, that God through Christ is not just making good people or bad people good again, but he's actually making dead people resurrect from their graves of sin to live life with him eternally. The message of the Bible is that God, through Christ, is turning his enemies into daughters and sons who love him forever. God, through Christ, the Bible tells us 
that he rescues rebels, haters, people who had hard hearts towards him and converts them to obedient servants who will love him and live for him and for his glory for all eternity. At that point, Karabo's eyes were wide open in shock. And then he said, bro, I'll be honest with you. I've actually never read the Bible. Um, my response, eyes wide open in shock as well. Not at the fact that he has never read the Bible, but for the fact that he actually admitted. Most people, and some of you might be in this room right now, never admit to the fact that you actually never read the Bible. People will argue till they blew in the face. They'll throw National Geographics in your face. They'll throw Richard Dawkins in your face. They'll bring out Da Vinci Code. They'll even turn to their uncle who's a conspiracy theorist. And when they're really desperate, they'll remember that moment in high school when they were drunk with their friends and they said something about God. But they will never put the Bible on the stand and let the Bible speak for itself. And so I wonder how many of us would be honest this morning to say that Garabo's story is our story. As we answer this question, is the Bible a bunch of fairy tales? Well, that's the presenting question. That's the presenting problem. But if we dig deeper than that, we realize that there is a question behind that question. And it's the question of authority. Is the Bible really authoritative? Does the Bible have the authority it claims to have? Because if it does, then that has implications for our lives. But if it is a bunch of fairy tales, then it emphatically has no authority at all. I mean, after all, who cares about the Bible of Humpty Dumpty? One, it doesn't exist. And if it did exist, you shouldn't care about the Bible of Humpty Dumpty. Because if Humpty Dumpty couldn't fix himself, what makes you think he'll fix you? But if the Bible is objectively true, and it has the authority it says it has. And church, we have two options this morning. First option, we will fully submit ourselves to all that Jesus through the Bible demands of us. Not tomorrow, not when we get in our cars, but today, now, in our seats, if the Bible has authority. The second option we have is that we won't argue around the Bible anymore. But put the Bible on the stand. Open it. Wrestle with the Bible. Let it speak. Let it, let it claim its case. And don't wrestle around it, but wrestle with it until you get to the truth. We don't have a third option, and that is to sit on the fence. Because if the Bible does have authority, and all that it says about our lives, about the life to come, about our hearts, about God, all of that has serious implications for our souls. And so I'm going to pray for us to ask God to help us to consider making a decision about what this means for our lives. So let's bow our heads and I'll pray for us. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we pray that you would help all of us, myself included, that we may walk out of here knowing what your Bible says about itself, what your word says to us about itself, and what that means for us today. In your wonderful and precious name we pray, amen. Amen. So what we're going to spend the rest of our time doing is, is answering this question. How do we determine the authority of the Bible? And there's a lot of things that I'm going to say from up front um, a lot of information overload. Uh, so, so I would ask you to please bear with me. And if your neighbor starts falling asleep, um, I would encourage you to just give them a young punch in the throat. Um, <laughs> just as an encouragement, because we all need to listen to God's word. If you have issues with that, please send Royden an email. Um, <laughs> but how do we answer the question whether the Bible has authority or not. Well, we can go to a lot of places. And again, we can get stuck in a bunch of information. But there are three models that we can try and use to answer this question. And now these models are not going to exhaustively uh, answer all the questions that we came in with this morning about the Bible. 
we would need a whole series for that. But at least what these models are going to do for us is that they're going to give us sufficient ground so that we can go back home and do our own homework of reading the Bible for ourselves. Because as much as the Bible is a human book, but it's also written by God, the Holy Spirit, who speaks to us at an individual level, personally, in our hearts. And so it wouldn't help us to just treat it like a human book and fail to realize that the Holy Spirit speaks to us through his very word. So these models are going to help us at least have some sufficient ground. So let's start off. Uh, I didn't even give you what these models are. If you're taking notes, uh, here, here's where we're going. The first one is the historically determined model. The second one is the community determined model. And the last one is the self-authenticating model. I'll say those again. First, historically determined model. The second one, community determined model. And the last one, a self-authenticating model. So what does the first one uh, seek to do, the historically determined model? So historically determined models seek to establish the authority of the Bible by critically investigating historical merits of each of the book, books of the Bible. So in other words, the burden to determine the authority of the Bible lies on our historical investigation. Can we investigate historically that the Bible is true and from that can we prove that it has authority? So there are many models under this category, but the one that I want to focus on this morning is called the neutral historical model. And many people, some are in this room, have used this model without even knowing that they're using this model. Have you ever heard somebody say this, or you might have said this yourself, Prove the Bible without using the Bible. Amen. You've heard that before. And what somebody is saying there is that use external evidence to validate the Bible. Use extra biblical data to affirm the claims of the Bible. Just don't open the Bible. And so what people are looking for there are at least two things. One, archaeological research or findings. And secondly, they want to see if the sources that are outside the Bible that speak about the life and ministry of Jesus. Richard Bockham helps us with the first one. Um, he doesn't exhaustively give us every single archaeological finding, uh, but what he does is that in his book called Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, uh, he does a, um, a comparative study of the amount of names used in the Gospels, and he compares that with names found in ancient Palestinian gravestones ancient records, and ossuaries. What an ossuary is is just an ancient, small version of what we would call a casket. They have somebody's bones there, the deceased, and then they would write uh, their name on the ossuary. And what Richard Bochum found in terms of ratio of names used in the Gospels and names found in historical documents, uh, the, the, the correlation was almost perfect. Here are his findings. And this is where I'm going to need you to punch your neighbor in the throat because we're going to go into numbers. Um, but he used two most used names, uh, male names in the Gospels, Simon and Joseph. And what he found in the Gospels is that the ratio came up to 18.2%. And then in historical records, it came up to 15.6%. Just a small difference. And then he went to look at the nine most popular male names in the Gospels. And they came up to 40.3%. And in historical records, they also came up at 40.3%. And then he did the same thing with female names. Two most used female names in the Gospels, Mary and Salome. And in the Gospels, they came up to 38.9%. In ancient records, they came up to 28.6%. And then he did the same thing with nine popular female names. In the Gospels, they came to 61.1%. In ancient records, they came to 38.9%. You can notice there that there's a difference when it comes to the female names, which kind of gives us an idea again and confirms what we know of first century culture, where women were treated like second-class citizens, so much so that they wouldn't even record much about them. But when you compare that to the gospel, you see how God has always had a heart to care for women and treat them the same way as image bearers as their male counterparts 
And so you would find a lot of names recorded in the Gospels because of that reason. That's one thing that you can use as archaeological evidence to prove whether the Bible um, has authority or not. The second thing is looking at external sources that speak about the ministry and life of Jesus. Now, there's a lot of these from historians, philosophers, authors, other religious texts uh, that speak about the life of Jesus. Uh, one historian uh, that is well known, uh, Tacitus, says this about Jesus. Listen to uh, this quote. Hence to suppress the rumor, he was falsely charged with the guilt and punished with the most exquisite tortures. The persons commonly called Christians who were hated for their enormities, Christus, the founder of their name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius, end of quote. And so when you think about the facts that emerge from that quote, at least there are five. And Tacitus is telling us that Jesus existed, number one. Number two, he was put to death. Number three, by Pontius Pilate. Number four, Pilate was ruling in Judea, five, under the reign of Tiberius. And all of these can be corroborated with other uh, historical research. Can we appeal to other histor uh, historical research? We can. But what will history help us with? Well, one, history will help us root the Bible in history. We can confirm from history that the Bible, as a human document, can be falsifiable, meaning that we can prove or test that the Bible is real as we corroborate it with external evidence. History can help us prove that the Bible is written in real time by real people who record real events. But here's where history is not going to help us. If we absolutize history, meaning if we make history the ultimate standard, which most people who use this model do that, even without knowing, then what we're saying by definition is that history is the ultimate standard and not the Bible. And so what we're saying there is that the Bible needs to take cues from history. Bible, the Bible needs to take its guidelines. The Bible needs to take its grounds to determine its own, its own authority from history. And so by, by definition, we should be historians and not Christians because history would be what we appeal to to find what ultimate authority looks like. And so what, that ha what happens then when we absolutize history is that the Bible becomes purely a human book and ceases to become God's word. In fact, listen to what Kelvin Van Hossa says, history alone. So if we put history and absolutize history alone, it cannot answer the question of biblical authority, but theology alone, the study of the Bible, or of God rather, from the Bible, that alone can stand alone to give us the authority of the Bible. So what am I saying in light of answering the question? If you are sitting here and you are skeptic and you think that the Bible is a bunch of fairy tales, History is going to get you closer to answering the question of authority. It won't fully answer the question of authority. History can help you realize that the Bible is not a bunch of fairy tales. It's written in real time by real people recording real events, but it's not going to help you answer the question of authority. If you're a Christian, what does this mean for you? We should not absolutize history and use history as the basis of our faith. The basis of our faith is Jesus and Jesus alone through the scriptures we are told so. And so history is a good tool to strengthen our faith, but history is not our master. Jesus is. And so if you want to find out if the Bible has authority, history will get you a step closer, but it's not going to fully answer that. That's our first model. Our second model is community determined. What do these models seek to do? Well, they, these seek uh, to view the authority of the Bible as something that is in some sense established or constituted by, by people, either individually or corporately, as they receive the Bible as the word of God. And so the burden here becomes um, on the community or the individuals to determine whether the Bible has authority. And as we've seen with our previous points, if that's the case, then by definition, 
the community, the church, or the individuals, then they have ultimate authority and no longer the Bible. And the Bible is rendered useless. We might as well worship whoever we have given ultimate authority to. And think about it, think about it this way for, for us. If our presiding bishop, Bishop Glenn Lyons, wakes up tomorrow and says that he has ultimate authority over the Bible, then we would cease to be Christians and we would have effectively become Lyonites and worship Glenn Lyons. Or if we bring it back home and think one day Royden gets a bright idea that he's going to have the ultimate authority over the Bible and he's going to conform the agenda of Christ church, or rather the agenda of the Bible to fit the agenda of Christ church, then in effect, we no longer Christians but we are Frostites, <laughs> worshipping Royden and Frost. And I must say, Frostites does not sound as cool as uh, Lionites. Um, Lionites sounds like we, the cousins of Spartans or some formidable Greek army. Uh, Frostites sounds like I'm saying Frostbites. Um, <laughs> which would be accurate, in fact. If we start worshipping Royden, uh, we would be frostbites, a, a cold cult, and no longer Christians. That's what we would be. In fact, Professor Kruger helps us uh, with this kind of model. He, he calls this the, the Roman Catholic model. Listen to what he says, and I quote, uh, it's a pretty long quote, so please raise your fist to your neighbor's throat. Um, but he says, Roman Catholicism denies that ultimate authority exists in the scriptures alone and has, a, has consequently adopted the well-known trifold authority structure that includes scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, the church's teaching on authority. The key component of this trifold authority is the magisterium itself, which is the authoritative teaching office of the Roman Catholic Church, primarily manifested in the Pope and his bishops. Although the magisterium is presented as only one of the three sources of authority, it is distinguished by the fact that it alone has the right to interpret scripture and tradition. And more importantly, it has the sole authority to define what the writings of scripture are and what tradition is in the first place." End of quote. And so you might be sitting here today and you've arrived at the conclusion that the Bible is a bunch of fairy tales one, because you've seen churches, individuals, and even denominations who treat the Bible this way. What I want to say to you this morning is that it's not the fault of the Bible. It's the fault of fallen, sinful, broken men who want to take authority and, and, and lord it over God himself. And that's exactly what our forefather did in the Garden of Eden when he wanted to take authority over God. And God said to Adam, like he's saying to us, if you do that, and surely death, brokenness, hurt, and confusion are going to be the results. And speaking about confusion, where do we get our idea of the church, of pastors, of ministry leaders? Where do we even get the qualifications of pastors? Well, we get it from the Bible. So how can we then turn around and say that the Bible establishes who we are as we sit here, a redeemed family of servants on mission, and then say we have authority then to determine what the Bible is. That is pure madness. It does not make any sense. But here's the thing. This is not how the Bible itself speaks of the relationship it has with its human authors. If you still have your Bible open, let's read together 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 till 21. Listen to what God says in his word in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 till 21. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what the Bible is telling us is that there's an ultimate cause for itself. And that ultimate cause is God, the Holy Spirit. He's the one who gives birth to the Bible. He's the one who writes it. But secondary to that, there's a proximate cause. And those are human beings, agents, who were used by God to write the Bible. So think of the proximate cause or human beings as the instrument, as a pen. 
and think of the ultimate cause as the hand, the person, the mind, God, the Holy Spirit. So it wouldn't make any logical sense that the pen would turn around and think that it has authority over the hand, the mind, or God, the Holy Spirit. And as a point of clarification here, I think it's worth noting that, that in its proper context, church leadership does have authority over various things, but those things are determined by the Bible. We don't sit around here during the week and as a staff and suddenly think, what do we have authority over? What can we lord our authority over? No, the authority that church leadership has is determined by the Bible and Bible alone. We don't have final or ultimate authority over the Bible. Our authority is borrowed from and is limited by the Bible. The Bible is God's ultimate word and is what has authority over all the affairs of this community. We don't believe the Bible just because um, humans said so. We believe the Bible because it is God's word. And in that case, let's, let's jump into our last point. So we looked at the historically determined models. We looked at the community determined models. And the last one is the self-authenticating model where the Bible speaks for itself. What does self-authenticating models seek to do? Well, they advocate that the authority of the Bible is found in the Bible itself. So by definition, ultimate or final authority cannot be grounded in anything else but itself, because it's ultimate, because it's final. God makes an oath, and he swears by nothing else but by himself. In fact, in Hebrews 6, verses 13, we are told, you don't have to turn there, but the author says, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. And that's, that's worthy to note there, that since he had no one greater, and I would even say since he has no one greater, and because he will never ever have anyone greater, he swears by nothing or no one but by himself. If God the Holy Spirit is the author of the Bible, then the Bible has and must be self-authenticating. See, in the other two models, the burden to determine authority was either on history or the community, but here the burden to determine authority is on the Bible itself. In fact, Charles Spurgeon was quoted saying something to this effect, that the word of God is like a lion. You don't have to defend a lion. Just stand back and it will defend itself. End of quote. The Bible provides internal evidence for itself. The Bible provides grounds, bases, and guidelines for external data and how to evaluate itself. Professor Kruger says this ultimate authority means that the Bible sets the terms for its own validation and its own investigation. To deny this is to overlook the unique nature of the Bible. The Bible is not just a book written by humans but it's a book written by God, the Holy Spirit. The Bible is not just a book that records history, but it's absolutely relevant for us today and it accurately depicts the world to come. The Bible is not just a book that can be falsifiable, but the Bible's very existence is a miracle. The Bible is not just the standard of truth, but the Bible is truth itself. There's no other book in the world like the Bible, written on three continents with three languages, with over 40 plus authors, kings, generals, fishermen, text collectors, doctors, historians. It has 66 volumes, over 100 plus topics that are covered uh, from cover to cover, and it's written over a period of 1,500 years, from the Old Testament to the New. You don't have to defend a lion, just step back and it will defend itself. So here's some homework for us as we go home. And this is not homework for the week, but it's homework for the rest of our lives. As we engage with the Bible, what are some of the guidelines the Bible gives us from the passage that was read earlier on um, that we can use as we think about whether the Bible has authority or not? And as we come to that conclusion, 
and see what the implications are for our lives. Um, the first one is in verses 17 and 18 there of um, first, Second Peter uh, chapter 1. And this is providential exposure, uh, the, the truth that the voice of God has providentially been exposed uh, in the Bible. Listen to what the word of God says. Verses 17, for when um, he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And see what Peter is saying there, what the Bible is saying of itself is that it has final authority because it possesses the voice of God. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2, the author tells us that in these last days that we're all living in, God has spoken to us through his son, the word. So over generations and generations of Christians that existed uh, in this world, God has providentially exposed his voice for them, for us today, in his word. And so we know that this book has authority because it has the voice of God. The second thing, a guideline that the Bible gives us, uh, what we find from this text, is the attributes of the Bible. What, what really makes the Bible two things there. Uh, it has divine qualities, which we've spoken about already. Uh, but in verses 17 and in verses 18, Peter uses this, this phrase, majestic glory, and he says that this voice was born from heaven. And so what he's saying to us is that the Bible has divine qualities. We see divinity speaking. And divinity is littered throughout the whole Bible. If you think of the story of Jesus himself and how he is God who became a human, came to this world and lived like one of us, and we saw divinity in the flesh. So the, the Bible has divine qualities. And that's something that we can look for as we are reading our Bible. And, and the second thing, there were attributed is this corporate reception. Listen to how many times Peter uses the word we uh, in these verses. Verses 16, for we uh, did not follow cleverly uh, devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Verses 18, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Verses 19a, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. And so what the word is telling us is that God saves us as individuals, but he brings us into a family, into a, a covenant community. Because if we would be left as islands, we can easily be deceived by the world, Satan, or our own flesh to twist the Bible to mean whatever we want it to mean. But collectively, we can keep each other accountable to the teachings of the Scripture. And the last thing there, and I'll close off with this, is that the Bible has the testimony of the Holy Spirit. Verses 19, uh, let's read what it says. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And so again, the Bible is a human book. We can use history to falsify the Bible and prove to see if it's not a fairy tale, but that it's written in real time. But at the same time, the Bible is a personal book, and God calls individuals again to himself through his word. And so he says in verses 19, pay careful attention. Pay attention to the prophetic word, and that is the Bible itself. And so if you are a believer, know that you have solid ground. Know that you have placed your faith and belief in something that is solid, not shaky, not sinking at all. As you read the promises of God, as you continue growing and knowing who Jesus is from his very word, don't cease to speak to God, or listen to him rather, from his word. Pay careful attention. And if you're sitting here today and you're still convinced that the Bible is a bunch of fairy tales, um, you would do well as well to pay attention to this prophetic word. Again, that history and community will get you close to answering whether the Bible has authority, but at some point you'd have to sit down and open the Bible for yourself. and Read what the Bible says 
And what the promise of God says to even those who have hardened their hearts and want nothing to do with God is that if you read this word, and if it is true, and it is true, and it has been proven to be true by Jesus himself, verses 19 tells us that the day will dawn and the morning star will arise in your hearts, meaning you will get clarity of who Jesus is. The blindness that is caused by our sin and the brokenness of this world will be removed as we engage with God's word and see Jesus for who he is, our Savior, our Lord, the one who came to die for us, live a perfect life that we have failed to live and did not leave us but promised to give us a helper, the Holy Spirit, did not leave us but left us with his word so that we know that he's near us and he will never leave nor forsake us. And so we can argue till we blew in the face. At some point, you have to sit with the Bible and reckon with God himself. So two options as I close again. One, I hope that you will wrestle with the Bible. Not wrestle around it, but wrestle with it until you get to the truth. And two, if you are convinced that this is God's final word, not tomorrow, not next week, but that today you would submit yourself fully to Jesus and his demands of you in this word. Because again, we don't have a third option. We cannot be on the fence. If it is true, it has real eternal implications for our lives. So what is your story going to be? Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, as we sang earlier on, uh, that we are, we are nobodies. And as you pick us and save us and bring us to yourself, you use us as instruments, Lord, to go tell a bunch of other nobodies about the only true somebody. And that is you, Lord Jesus. Father, without your word, we are in darkness. Without your word, we are thirsty without your word we are hungry so we're very grateful Lord that you've preserved your word for us over years and years of the church being persecuted but you have kept your word for this time and for future Christian generations Lord we want to pray for those who don't know you we want to pray for those who think that your word is it's not relevant it's not as true as we claim it to be or it claims itself to be. Pray, Father, that today may be that first step, that they actually sit down with your word, not speak around you, but speak with you. And only you can do that, Holy Spirit. None of us can stand here and claim to be Christians from our own work, but you brought us to yourself. So bring those, Father, who who don't know you, work in their hearts to save them. In your wonderful and precious name we pray, Jesus.